recording. Simon Leake in the HR studio. Very, very glad to have had the introduction from uh, our mutual friend, Christy Vincent. Yes. The real Christy Vincent. The real the, it, apparently, that's, the real. His, that's his real name. I didn't know all these years. <laughs> Dishonest. Um, here we are. So, <clears throat> thoroughly enjoyed the icebreaker. Thoroughly enjoyed that. Yeah. I'm looking forward to expanding on some more of those topics on this. So, uh, like brief outline for myself. Uh, you joined Power Edge 3 Power 1982 just after the Falklands. Yeah. You And then you, your military career took you from there, took you to Hereford, 2 2 SAS. Yeah. Um, <coughs> which we were going to come on to as well. Yeah. And then, so where you are now as a, a horrible civilian, uh, is the founder <laughs> and um, manager, director of Big Five Protection, which deals in conservation and anti poaching yeah. predominantly in Africa, right? Predominantly Africa, Predominantly yeah, Africa at the moment. Right. Why yeah. did you why did you join up? Why and so here's the question. Yeah. Why did you join up in nineteen eighty two? Well, you wouldn't have known actually. I'm just thinking of young Simon Leake yeah. getting to the military, mm. getting to three power just after they've come back from the Falklands. Yeah. That well, is the it, worst possible time to join. It's it's <laughs> it's it's not really it's not something you 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 think through. So here's here's the deal. I when I left school, I had no desire to have anything to do with the military. It wasn't on my radar, but my brother was already in the Royal Marines. My my brother was a bit of an inspiration to me because he's like six foot two and um, looks like a Royal Marine, you know. So he he joined the Royal Marines. I got a job uh, in a in a land gang, um, you know, picking potatoes and vegetables and that sort of stuff. And eventually got a job on a farm, and that's all I was ever going to do. I had a I, I got married, young, lived on the farm, got a farm cottage, a tied a tied cottage, and that was my life mapped out. I had no desire to do anything so stupid as joining the military, but. Um, I, uh, very, uh, yeah, long story short, as they say, uh, to sustain my measly wage, I um, helped myself to some of the uh, uh, poaching, basically, which is a, is a bit of an irony there, I know. But I got kind of rumbled for for poaching. and um, Poaching veg? Veg, you know, poaching pheasants. I used to go, go out at night with an air rifle and a torch. Um, and uh, they poach the, the local gamekeeper's pheasants. Um, and I got rumbled, which meant I had a bit of an argument with uh, the, you know, the farmer I worked for, which meant that I, I then um, had to find another job. So I, I was in this sort of quandary now. I'm married. I haven't got a house. I haven't got a job. And my brother came to visit, and this was 1982, April. Sorry, you're married, but you didn't have a house. Where were you living? Are we living in a farm cottage? You were together, in a and, and, be okay. and because because I was now moving on, and the, the job supplied the farm cottage. Yes, for you and your wife. Yeah, and you went poaching. Yeah, got and I was, sacked, and I was poaching. I didn't get sacked as such, but we I got rumbled, and I I didn't know, I didn't really realise. This is a long story. You won't go into that. I'd been I'd been rumbled um, for my poaching activities, and then we we had a big fallout, and uh, and I sort of stormed off the job. You know, because I was living in a house that had no, uh, had electricity, but had no hot water, no toilet. You know, it was a very basic house, and uh, I thought I could do better than this. But my brother came to visit me at that time, and I'm I'm saying to him, I don't know what I'm going to do next. I'm going to get a get a job somewhere else. So I've got to get another house. Um, and it was April 1982. He's in a Royal Marines, four two commando, and he got recalled to go back. And as he was leaving my house. <coughs> To get uh, to make his way back, he said, "What about? Why don't you just join the army?" And uh, so that that sowed, sowed the seed, really. Now, prior to this, I'd done a bit of work with the TA. I joined the local TA, which was a parachute regiment. Got my wings and never did any more. You know, so I was an airborne oh, tractor right. driver. Okay. Warmer, warmer <laughs> wings on my on my sort of overall. But I was did never going to really? do any one of that. Did you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because you would do, because I was young, you know, um, I'm, I'm very proud, but there's no way I was going to join the army. So I thought, okay, well, why don't I do that? So the next thing, I've gone to the recruiting office. Um, they tried to get me to join the Royal Anglians, but I was adamant I was going to join the parachute regiment. And because my brother was now on the Canberra uh, heading down to the Falklands, 
it, 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 it's, they sort of fast track me through to so by you know this was April May June by September I was heading off down to the depot on the train from Lincoln and life changes you know I got on that train um, to go to Lincoln thinking what the hell am I getting myself into you get off in Aldershot you get picked up back of a Land Rover and and that's it life changes um, so I, I got through that uh, my wife uh, moved down, married quarter straight away. Uh, so that was that was me. One minute I'm picking vegetables and and combine, uh, the, the helm of a combine harvester. The next thing I'm a bloody paratrooper jumping out of airplanes. You know. I was about. To, uh, sorry, I was about to ask um, why you're adamant not angling as para reg, but then you'd already done the TA para. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. And I and I wouldn't have. You know, it, it was that that or nothing. And I thought I'll give this a, a, a chance. I'll give it one crack. If I don't make it, I'll go and find another a proper job. And I and I sort of I thought I'll do three years, then I'll get out. And I tried to, you know, I was going to do that, join the fire brigade or police or something. But you had to already be out in order to apply for those jobs. So I just kind of stayed in and and uh, with no view to do anything other than you know do do a few more years and get out and get a proper job. I never I never saw it as a career. But I stayed in for twenty four years in the end. What was it like when you what was it like being in three power just after they came back? Joining just after they came yeah. back. What was that environment like as um, a Joe back? Yeah, well you sort of you felt even though I was older than most of them, because I I was twenty two years old, you know, they, they they were already calling me dad and granddad, <laughs> and I, that stuck with me right the way through. Um but, uh, it, yeah, because we, we just listened to all the stories. And a lot of the guys, they still had the bullet wounds and, you know, they were still arguing about things that were, were going on. And there was a great camaraderie, camaraderie between them, which, of course, those of us who just joined um, weren't part of. Uh, but it was never really an issue or a problem. You know, everybody has sort of left that behind now and we were moving forward. But I didn't stay in the, in the rifle company for long. Um, I sort of did a one of the first sniper courses that they that they ran in three power Af after experiencing snipers in the Falklands and seeing how effective they were. Um, and from that, I went to patrols platoon within six months, which is the reconnaissance platoon. Rapid. It, it was rapid. And when I put my name down for it, you know, they said the carders are coming up, and I thought, what, what's a carder? I've got no idea. I had no idea. And uh, they went through machine guns, anti-tank signals, patrols. And it's the only one I could get my head around. Patrols, oh, I, I, maybe I can do that because it's patrolling, patrolling. That's what we do. <laughs> I didn't realize what it was. And a very, very hard selection process. Fantastic. You know, they, they, and, and a very, very respected platoon at, at that time and hopefully still is. So I spent the, the next six years in patrol platoon. With small team ta tactics. Um, getting away from the rifle company sort of um, shenanigans, uh, and I really enjoyed it. So then there was a natural progression then. To I was say yeah, good yeah. puts you on a good foot in there for the Hereford selection. Like, yeah. Did you go to the jungle with patrols? Yeah, we we did. Uh, well, I went to um, we did six months in Belize, and then we did another tour in in eighty eight. Um, was the platoons went? We met up with two para patrols. Six and months. The whole platoon did six months. Um, yeah, no, the whole battalion. That was a battalion trip for six months to Belize. Training? Yeah, we're training and, and holding the fort because there was a threat from Guatemala ah, then. Right. So okay, I was gonna say, there was OPs and, and that sort of got stuff. Got it, got yeah. it, yeah. So it was, it was one of the tours, six months Belize, six months Cyprus. Um, oh, so it, it wasn't exclusively training, yeah. It was when, you, when, when you said six months. Because the way I... Uh, Remember the the jungle training, yeah. Right, and it was uh, it was all just training, and it would be four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, to yeah. wherever you went. Dude, but, but there was no operations mixed, in, mixed in, into infantry it. Was, yeah, yeah, no, it it was it was just a, a tour of duty sort of thing to to yeah to hold the fort <coughs> there, but with some really good good training and fantastic environment. So I I I was familiar with the jungle and jungle tactics. So the the transition to do selection. I found the jungle not easy, but it, I was quite familiar with with um, how things worked and how you administer yourself, which is the big thing. For people who aren't aware, so <coughs> can you explain to me why why the jungle 
is so important when it comes to when it comes to Hereford selection because it still is now, right? It's a huge yeah. piece. Yeah. Why, why is yeah. that? Um, because the the jungle phases people more than any other environment, um, and and that's because it's such a difficult place to work. If you don't get your <coughs> your admin, your act together in the jungle, then the jungle will eat you up. So it's, it's, the, it's the heat, the humidity, the, diff, the, the massively difficult terrain. Everywhere you go, it's, it's an effort. You're uphill, downhill. Um, back then, GPSs didn't work, so everything was mi almost micro-navigation. Pacing, 10-meter pacing, um, compass bearings, maps that weren't accurate. Um, Infection and illness comes on much faster as well, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it, it does. Any small cuts and grazes, you have to tend everything. I mean, there's, there's a system you have to go to just to survive as far as your daily work and then your nighttime routine, you know, carrying your dry kit, keeping it dry, putting a, a, a hammock up in a way that you're not going to get wet because it's going to rain in, in torrents every night. And if you get wet, if your dry kit gets wet, then you're stuffed. You just stay wet. You're going to get covered in rashes. Um, so you you have to be very particular about the way you live. Um, in in that environment, foot powder all over at night. You just want to explain the wet dry routine just very quickly for people. Wet dry. Okay, so you horrible. You, you, Getting up you, in the morning, chucking you, your wet kit. Yeah, horrible. You, you carry two <laughs> two sets of kit. One one you wear during the day. So you could be out there six weeks of up to two months wearing the same clothing that absolutely stinks. You can get as wet as you want, that's fine. Your feet, feet are constantly wet, your whole body's wet. At night time, after dark, you put your hammock up, you, you put your, sh you know, your shelter sheet over the top, that's protecting you from the elements, and then you get changed into your dry kit. Um, so it's dry set of uniform, uh, dry socks, you powder your feet, you dry your, around your knackers and everything um, under your armpits, and you get a really good night's sleep. Pair of trainers on. Everything's packed away just in case you have to do a fast move. Your compass is on your um, emergency RV bearing in case you have to bug out during the night. And you get a good 12 hours sleep. But in the morning, you're up at, depending how long you, you, it takes you to, to do your routine, you're up, you take your nice warm dry kit off, you roll your little sleeping bag up, put it away and then you put your wet kit on and that is the most awful <laughs> it's, it's it's the most awful feeling to put this stinking wet kit on you can, you can almost you never get used you, to it either. You, no you don't and you think right when i you know when i get out of this i'm never doing this again um and so but you know after a while it, it gets to body temperature and you're away you know you you pack up you're away as soon as it's light enough to read your map you're off you stop you have a breakfast stop a brew and then you're off for the day and that happens night after night um and if like i say if you you get your dry kit wet through doing a river crossing or you, you haven't packed it away properly it's not waterproof um then you're, you're in fucked. a world of hurt you, yeah. you can't stop to dry it off you you know it's it's so it's a fantastic environment <coughs> but you don't know how hard it is until you're actually out there doing it. And I've, I've been out there with civilians. I mean, later on in my career, I was, I was taking um, people, you know, involved in the procurement of kit and, and that sort of stuff. And uh, taking um, civilians or military people who hadn't experienced the jungle before, because, we, you know, we'd be looking at jungle boots or jungle clothing and just spending a few days with them. And, and um, you know, you, you can see the toll on them he's going out for a small walk around and um you know by the time you get back they're you know they're absolutely exhausted bright red faces um heart palp palpitations and and you know it's literally yeah you, know, you can have whatever boots you want just get just get us out of here you know um so it, it kind of we we get used to operating like that because we're we're hardy and tough uh but it's when you get somebody else into that environment you you think bloody hell this is this is going to kill people, you know, if they, if they haven't got your act together. It's very, very, it's so hot, so humid that just breathing, just doing normal um, basic activities is can be quite tiring. You're sweating. You, you've got to be constantly drinking water to replace the sweat. Um, it's a good weight loss strategy. It's, it's an excellent weight loss strategy. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I've, I've got a picture of me 
uh, somebody took after we'd we'd finished our, you know, six weeks in the jungle on on the selection, um, <coughs> and we, were, we it's ridiculous. We all look like skeletons, you know, and it, it took me probably six months to recover uh, from that whole process before I I actually went out and did any training and running because the body was just recovering from the whole selection process. But the jungle part of it is just rags you completely. Um, but I, I've spent an awful lot of my military career in, in jungles more, more than any other environment. So I, I love it, you know, and heading back soon as well. Oh, we'll come okay. on to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Was uh, did when when you got to Hereford, did, as in you passed selection, did it live up to your expectations? A hundred percent, yeah, yeah. It was it was so refreshing to be. I, I've never, I, I think, because I joined the army quite late, I never really, <clears throat> I wasn't really indoctrinated, if you know what I mean, by you know the procedures and processes and and how the army do things. Um, which is why I was very comfortable in the patrol platoon. It was all a bit more grown up, you know, and, and the way we did our business. So when I got to Hereford, it was even more so. Everybody's on first name terms. There's no no bullshit at all. Everybody, it's all very very grown up environment. Serious, but um, everything is done in a very professional but grown up way. So, you know, when I first went into A Squadron, into the the sort of interest room, the offices. There's a guy sat on the desk and he, he goes, all right, what's, what's your name, mate? And a couple of us, and we told him a name and he told us his first name and we're chatting away and I thought, you know, this must be one of the lads like, you know, or maybe it's a cleaner, I don't know, but chatting away. <laughs> and he, he was a squadron sergeant major, you know, and one of the, you know, so you meet all these amazing characters and everybody's just, you know, no airs and graces. Uh, no one's trying to look the part. Everybody's just, you know, not just normal sort of people but um with everybody's been through the same process you know that that um relentless pursuit of excellence is is behind everybody and and it's a it's a great environment to work and it must be one of the most um um privileged places to work as far you know Parridge was great but getting to Hereford and and working and operating with a, it's a whole bunch of very sensible individuals um, cause it's just a filtering process, isn't it? Or, you know, joining power edge is a filtering process. Joining patrols was a filtering process. And then it's a further filtering process to, to get to Hereford. Um, so, you, you know, and you're filtering out all those, the sort of people who, um, are good people, but they're, they, you know, they, they're just not quite the mold. And so you 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 you're in amongst people who are more the same mould of of individuals, um, and it's it was for me it was just almost like not being in the military, uh, and that that's the way I saw it. So it you know f coming from you know a career in farm working, having my the military bit, which is the training and and the sort of rifle company, to the progression into the sort of small team tactics and, and quite sort of grown up um, attitude to what we were doing. Um, it, you know, I, I was very much in my comfort zone through, you know, apart from, you know, doing core cramming courses in and, and the, the pace of life, which was very, very fast. Uh, it was a very comfortable environment for me to work in. Yes. Yeah, so you must have gone from, <clears throat> Drop my coffee then. You must have gone from a relative <clears throat> lull in ops part of Northern Ireland in the eighties when you were with with uh, three para yeah. to then Hereford. I'm assuming late eighties and then into which, but then you went into the era of which we touched on the icebreaker of we had the first Gulf. Yeah, you had the Balkan stuff going on. Yeah, you had stuff going all over the world on yeah. on smaller scales, especially on the yeah. SF side. Was the was the pace? Did you like the pace of life as well? Were you still married at this point? Um, no, actually, when I when I joined, one of the 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 um, reasons to push me to do selection, which I wasn't something that was on my radar, was I was just going through a divorce, and it was like, and the battalion was about to go to Ireland, that two years in Ireland, eighty eight to 
uh, to 90. And I knew I was 28 years old and I knew that if I didn't go, I, I couldn't, you know, you, you can't do selection if, you, if you're on an operational tour, which is Northern Ireland. So that's what pushed me. So I, I packed up my bin bag full of kit. I bought a, a car called the Talbot Tagore, which is a ridiculously massive car. And I drove to Hereford and, uh, and parked it up. Um, so, um, yeah, what was the, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Rambling on. The, 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 the pace of life suit you, the change in yeah. the pace of life. You went to slow and it, steady, it, it three did, power that time. To you know, it. yeah, because, it, you know, my whole army career to that date had been training, training, training for the, the, the operation that would once come. The big question everybody had, as we all filtered through the training in Hereford, we would ask the DS, what's, what's, the, what's the chances of getting on an operation? And the answer was, Woof, every you know, every two years at least, you'll be involved in an operation. Every two years, and we're like, ah, well, you know, within two years, we're going to be involved in some sort of operation. <laughs> and and shit, 1990 <laughs> happened, and it was like, when can we stop now? <laughs> can we stop and do some training? Um, so the life picked up, but for me, it, the I mean, the first couple of years at Hereford. The first thing I did was a, um, a demolitions course, which was the hardest thing I'd ever done. I had to cheat my way through that, you know. Um, the calculations, the rules for this, the rules for that, it, you know, you cram, cram everything. Then we did, we did trips away. We went to Australia, to Indonesia, to Oman, and it was all in a, in a, in a Hercules aircraft. So everywhere we went, it was five days to go with that and it was just training you know training with a, you know, a hint of operations um and it was like off you know go away and do that come back six months on the counter-terrorist team finish that training you know uh, training 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 um for me i i went into um uh, the maritime the boat troop side so I, I had to learn the diving special forces diving um small boat tactics so it, it, it's a case of you got two years to become a useful member of this troop. So as well as doing your, you know, your, your sort of personal skills, demolitions I did, medics I did, it was um, the small boat courses, diving courses, uh, which involves an awful lot of, you know, the, the diving side they don't do now. But, um, uh, you know, how to get onto ships, how to operate with, with um, all naval assets. So it's you never stop learning. It, it's like well, okay, we've we've done that, we've done that. What's next? Um, there's just you know, there's just no no letting up, and and then the operations start, you know, and then it's like okay, well we were due to do that, but now we're heading off somewhere. Well, the, next I mean, talking about the operations all overseas there, but you mentioned the, the counterterrorism team. The CT team must have been interested at that time as well during the nineties because of what was still pretty hot mm. across the water. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. They, I mean, the, the, the counter terrorist team at the time, it was all based on, you know, what everybody understood, uh, the sort of Prince's Gate type thing. So um, how to get into buildings and the demolition side came into it. Um, and then the the sort of Northern Ireland was was um, uh, was quite high on the 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 radar as well. So there was a lot of stuff going on over there, sort of. Um, uh, that you could get involved in at a moment's notice kind of thing. Um, but, the, yeah, the team was always interesting, new skills, etc. But when it's then coming around to your second tour and then the third tour and your fourth tour, it all gets a bit dull, you know, because everybody's waiting for the next hijacked aircraft to come along. And uh, so it's training, training, training at a very, very high level, waiting for that one opportunity to, to go and prove your worth kind of thing. How did... How did two two evolve over that time that you were in? Because you you joined at a time when it was it, you know, over that period you were in it went through quite an evolution, right? It, I mean, partly to do because it became much more in the public eye, yeah. And obviously, the nature of the threat that the world or the UK was facing yeah. was were changed drastically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it was an evolution, and and the the, the special air service regiment has always done that since the Second World War. And being reformed for Malaya, you know, jungle operations, and then it was desert operations, um, and then then sort of 
they realized that they, they needed, you know, counterterrorism was a big thing, so they, they just evolved a counterterrorist side. Um, and it was like that all, all the way along, and with it, the regiment is constantly looking for where's the next threat going to be and how do we prepare ourselves for that. So all of a sudden you get experts, you know, people going away and becoming experts in one thing or, or another, some, in you know, insertion method that we'd never even thought of before. Uh, because that might be the next sort of the way things are, are going. But obviously the Middle East became very um, prevalent again from the first Gulf War onwards. Um, then the Balkans happened, and that's a completely different kettle of fish. So it's like, okay, now you, you're going from uh, the, the, the Middle East and everything that you were doing there. Now change your hat very, very quickly because... We're going, to, we're going to find a way of getting you into this, this new conflict because this is going to be a long term. So I, I was involved in one of the first um, small groups to go out there with the, uh, the, the mission was there is no mission, go and find something uh, to do kind of thing, you know, go and get involved <laughs> and see what there is to do. And that's, and that's what we Quality. did. And, and the next thing there's, you know, there's, there's then squadron level operations going on and, and, um, which I was involved in for a little bit, uh, uh, you know, and that's the nature. It's like, okay, what are, what's what's on the radar? <coughs> Intelligent people are thinking, okay, we're going to start getting involved in this, and people will start disappearing into those, you know, to 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 find what's going on, what's happening, how can we get involved? Uh, and then the next thing that you know, you you you're off doing something that you never even thought, uh, you know, wasn't 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 in your thought process. You think, oh shit! What what are we going to get involved in now? You know, there was um, all of the, um, you know, picking up of the war crimes, individuals going around, in, and um, a lot of other stuff, interesting stuff that was going on as well. So yeah, so it, it's you know, once your feet touch the ground in a in a in a unit like that, you you never stop. You know, and it's brilliant. You know, there's no time to rest, and you you you're sort of taking on board new skills. Um, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. But and the, and the and the good thing about the special air service is it's so diverse. You've got people from the engineer background, people who are fixed helicopters, you know, infantiers, um, people from all walks of life. So it doesn't matter what you're going to do. There'll be somebody who's got an element of mindset and skills. Uh, that can adapt to those environments, you know. So, and it and it's it, that was a something that I was very impressed with. You know, how people are selected, uh, and somebody who's who has got no idea how to read a map, but they're intelligent individuals because they've they've been Remi engineers or or you know aircraft mechanics or something like that. Because they're very bright, they pick it up very quickly. Um, you know, go to the jungle. They've got no idea how to operate in a in a place like the jungle, but they quit, they pick it up very very quickly. So those of us, you know, the bulk of the, the individuals of you know parachute regiment, for instance, um, uh, you might say are the backbone. But it's all these other individuals who have been just very very bright, very sharp, very quick at picking up all the skills, who very often go on to become you know the more senior senior people there. Just because, I mean, there's people I've thought, there's no way you're going to pass this course. You've, you've, you've polished a helicopter for the last three years. You've got no chance. But um, sure enough, boom, they are. And then the next thing, they're a squadron sergeant major. You know, some years later, you think, how did you do that? Or, the, you know, some of, there's a couple of guys who were chefs, army chefs. And you think, well, you joined as a chef. You've got no place here. Yeah, I knew but a clerk. I knew a clerk that joined. Clark, them. Yeah, it was, it was very well respected there. Yeah, yeah, a, a, a fucking clerk. Hundred <laughs> percent. And but people will go, well, that's that must be a shit unit because that's you know he's a bloody clerk. What does he know? Yeah. And you think no, that clerk's actually, you know, to 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 climb that mountain, um, makes you a very good operator in in the end. If you can get through the selection process, and you're you're having to learn what everybody else knows. Because you, you take th everybody through the basics. This is a map. This is what a map looks like. This is a compass. So that everybody has the same chance and opportunity, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah. arguably, maybe, arguably, those those who are, so talking too, too specific, yeah. those who aren't Power Edge, 
but decide to go for it. They've arguably got they've arguably got more drive and determination than a Power Edge guy yeah. has. Just because for Power Edge, it's a it's it's less of a mountain, I think, in terms yeah. of do I think I can achieve that or not? Because there's mm. so many who have, and you see people going off all the time yeah. to go and attempt it. Yeah. Yeah. So, to, mm. yeah, to come in from a from a, a unit or a job that has nothing to do with what we might <laughs> term soldiering, and to, to have the audacity to even <laughs> to even expect yeah. that you've got an opportunity, and you take your hat off to them. Yeah, yeah bloody hell. So um, yeah, and it, very often you see their career path. Uh, they're up and away, you know, with the rest of us donkey wallopers are going bloody hell. You know, yeah. How did how did he do that? Yeah. That kind of lifestyle must have been something you missed when you left. <clears throat> um, no. Uh, I, I did. You know, after 24 years, I could have stayed on and I could have, you know, start going around the bazaars and, and maybe maybe there's a commission down there further down the line. But I, I thought it was time to leave because uh, I was, what, in my mid-40s, I suppose. <clears throat> Um, and I thought if I'm going to if I'm going to leave and you know go back to you know farm working whatever I was going to do, uh, I better make a move now. Um, and it, it's quite funny because there's no there's no um, fanfare when you're leaving, no big <coughs> parties, no you know in the mess and everybody claps you out. You you just go around, you say goodbye to a few people in the different departments, um, go to the the main security gate. I remember going in and and handing in my pass um, and everything I had that gave me access into the camp. Uh, one of the old MOD police, an old guy I knew for quite a few years, stood up and shook my hand and he said, thanks for everything. And that's the first time I thought, bloody hell, I'm leaving. Because as you walk out, that metal gate closes behind you. And that's quite symbolic in some ways, because that's it. You're no longer entitled. Everything you've done, you know, You've been going in there, you know, on a daily basis. I had a married quarter across the road. And I thought, well, that's it then. So what am I going to do now? So I walked across the road home. We sorted out buying a buying a house in Hereford. I was married again by this time. Um, and just, just carry on normal jogging, as they say. Uh, but because all the jobs that I did, I was working with, with ex-colleagues anyway. So it almost never felt like I'd, I'd finished. I'm with the same people, we're talking the same shit, um, you know, and, and I just went through a variety of jobs on the circuit, as we say, working with old old pals and, and, and people, you know, like-minded sort of people. So it, it never felt like a transition at all. And I think because I think the key thing is I, I didn't leave school and go straight into the military. I had a normal job and a normal life, and it was almost by accident. You know that I that I joined. I never intended to. I never intended to stay on. So when I left, it was like, okay, well, that, that chapter went on a bit longer than I thought. But now I'll get back to normal, normal life. But leaving, so oh six, you left. So yes. you went into the, you went onto the circuit, the private security circuit. Yeah. Then, if you want to generalise at that, that yeah. was a pretty interesting time as well. Then, wasn't it? The circuit was interesting then at the same time. Yeah, yeah. For very much the same reasons the ops were interesting. Yeah. And, uh, uh, the the regiment had lost an awful lot of people. It, it hemorrhaged an awful lot of people because of the massive money that was being made. There were guys leaving, starting up, you know, some of the big companies which are still in existence today. And it was almost like this this mad exodus. So and so's earning how much a day? Bloody hell, you know. And I'm and I'm, you know, going through the normal, you know, we're going on the SB team again. Um, so the the regiment it was a almost a bit of a crisis I think the amount of people who were jumping onto that bandwagon. <clears throat> Two thousand and six and that was still ongoing. Um, but for me I, I found a training job um, in a in a sort of a stately home close to Hereford uh, it, and it was um, an organisation um, that was doing close protection training. But there was a new thing starting where we were we were training American special forces in counter IED stuff, and it it, it was all the, the sort of Northern Ireland uh, surveillance tactics and that sort of stuff. So I got involved in that. I, I ran the team that did that training for a while, and then I, there's another company in Hereford um, that were part of an American company doing military kit and equipment, com communi ruggedized communications equipment called Tactronics and I got a and I got a job there doing the maritime lead. So I never left Hereford. 
Um, but I was working with, you know, six guys and, and people that I knew, which suited me. I did that job for three years until we were all made redundant. And and then it was only after that that I, I started working overseas. My, you know, I had a daughter then and she was growing up and she was she about the time she was going to college. Um, so I was then working in Slovakia for, for several years on a um, close protection team. And that was that was fine, easy money. That was going to go on forever. I thought that was it. But then we got made redundant, and then that closed down. By this time, I'd bought a cottage, and it, it was uh, almost derelict. Um, then I managed to find work in Kurdistan. Um, that was sh going to be short-term work, and then they were going to take me on full-time, working out there with one of the oil and gas Canadian company. Even better money, you know, and I'm doing it. I've got this project on. I'm, I'm doing this house up. Great, great, great. And then the the world turned around with Islamic um, uh, ISIS. ISIS attacking places and the price of oil dropping. So that folded. And then I found myself in in another quandary. Now, okay, now shit. Now I've got I've got a, a you know a ruin of a house that I'm, I'm plowing lots of money into, um, and no work again. And that's when I got the opportunity to. That's when Africa opened up, and I had an opportunity to to go out there. This is just for for people listening, right? I just want to highlight a point here. Yeah. For people listening who are either in or are considering getting into the security industry <coughs> and think in Middle East because people still think it. What you're just talking through, and correct me if I'm wrong, Simon. What yeah. you're just talking through there, that the way it, the instability of it. Yeah. That is absolutely what it is. I've heard that story a million times. Yeah. And it's one of my. It's like part of my story as well. Yeah. 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 Job redundant. Job <coughs> contract lost. Job gone. Job gone. Job yeah. gone. Looking yeah. for job. No job. Looking yeah. for job. Got a job. It's a fucking nightmare. It is. It's a nightmare. But one of the problems is when people are in that job, they tend not to t say how crap it is to people who are looking to get into it. Yeah. It's interesting. You're yeah. never going to get the. you never going to get the real picture. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. know, don't get me wrong. There are there are people who've who've been on the circuit for a, a long time. They've been on long term contracts, mm -hmm. and they've did, you know, and and for whatever reason, and they're they're the lucky ones. But for the majority of people, it's exactly the experience you yeah. just talked through. Yeah. You know. Um, on on the on the circuit, absolute bloody nightmare. Just give it two thoughts before you think to get into that. And interested, you're saying that having the same experience and your yeah you know, with your background, you know, a two two background. You know, it's yeah. it's um, <clears throat> bloody horrible. I hate even thinking about that time when I was on the circuit. It's yeah. so horrible. Yeah. But um, so Africa <coughs> was that security there? Then was that what popped up, or was that no, no? It was. Um a job opportunity for um, a company called New Century, who would uh, the the mainstay of their work um, was in the Middle East, um, completely different. But an opportunity came. I think as things were winding down in the Middle East, everybody could see the writing on the wall. Um, an opportunity came up to do training in Botswana, the Botswana Special Forces, because um, the Special Forces unit there who were depleted, run down. Um, and it was a training team put together to go in and, and run um, selections and then continuation training and all the typical special forces type training that they needed. So I managed to, to jump onto that team. Um, I went there, a team of, I don't know, maybe almost a dozen of us. Excuse me. Um, and my job was to run the selection part of the process. So we were selecting guys from the Botswana military, the Botswana Defence Force, volunteers, coming in, running uh, a selection that lasted four months. Um, so it was a, the, the initial selection, all the fitness and everything else, map reading and, and all the stuff that we do, but in a, in a sort of watered down way. And then the continuation training, which is patrolling and that sort of stuff. Now, I'd, I'd spent two years at the Jungle Warfare Wing in Brunei as the senior military instructor there uh, in, the, in the jungles of Borneo. And I'd learned tracking there. And we, we'd, I spent two years teaching tracking as well as infantry skills in the jungle with, with a, the team of trainers. So it was the tracking bit that I was particularly interested in um, uh, because it's, a, it, it's an am amazing, fantastic skill which is so underrated, particularly by the British Army. It was quite a frustrating time. Training, you know, we, We're training these people with this amazing skill, the, the ability to follow 
um, an individual or, or group of individuals when they're no longer there and work out where they've been, what they've done. You know, there's a lot of information there that we're missing. So I introduced that into the training that we're doing in Botswana, even though they, they said they, they didn't need it because they thought they were all naturally, they were, they were trackers. We showed them a little bit of what they didn't know. And they said, wow, this is brilliant. So we then started putting tracking courses into these special forces um, training courses for these guys, as well as, you know, we had unlimited ammunition. It, it was brilliant, you know, teaching them all the contact drills and that sort of stuff. So we, we were getting to a high standard. So two of us were running the selection process. Then we handed them over to the next team who would go in all the, the counter-terrorist stuff. So they had a, 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 an awesome air base, which you, you'd absolutely love to be based at. You know, there's an old aircraft, there's a, um, a CQB house, there was a, a parachute center to, to learn free fall parachuting, all completely run down. It had been all, all sort of developed in the, in the <coughs> 90s there. I don't know, uh, perhaps the Americans had a hand in it. Um, an assault course that was overgrown, ranges all overgrown, typical African sort of style. They had all these facilities, but they, they just never used them. So we went in there with bulldozers and we got everything up and running and um, trained these, you know, put this unit back up to a, a sort of a three squadron um, unit again with all the skills that they needed. And then we pulled out. So I spent 18 months doing that and then thought, OK, well, that, that was brilliant. And how refreshing to be able to use the skills that I've I've learned over 24 years Instead of me doing, you know, just security, you know, well-paid but useless security stuff or close protection for, you know, American corporates, uh, which is mind-numbingly dull, but but nice money. Now I'm actually using all of those skills, and I and I'm I'm training people and watching them develop, you know, and particularly the tracking course. Can I ask a quick question on that? Yeah. Sorry, just jump in. Why do you think the British Army underrates tracking then? Because um, commanders, it's not on their radar. They don't understand it. It's not something that's covered in, in Sennybridge, you know, in, in the, your sort of career path. It's a bit like sniping was in the early days when they were, you know, the battalions didn't have sniper units. They didn't know what to do with snipers. Well, with the tracking, it was exactly the same so in brunei we would run several tracking courses a year and all these you know ncos would then and officers would filter back into the unit and they would never be used they because nobody understood what a tracker can do so when you're doing the exercises um you know it's how you, to apply you, them tactically right yeah they can't you know it's like well where do you sit in the all bat you're you're not in the pamphlet as such uh, and, and how are we going to all about you? And there's this thing that uh, tracking is just a jungle skill, and we don't fight wars in the jungle now. So on that, on that, then, mm. where would you, where would you, in a in a conventional infantry unit setup, where would you have the trackers? Where would they sit in the all and how would you employ them? Well, it's 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 kind of difficult. Um, I for me, it would be in the reconnaissance platoons, probably um to go out so if if for instance you're in a in a harbor area and you you know the the enemy are seem to be probing in and there's a, a bit of a contact well a tracking team now get a tracking team on there you know from your reconnaissance or they could be sitting anywhere because you know what it's like you this, and this is a problem they had with the the snipers they wanted to put two snipers in in every platoon but the trouble is, once you're senior enough to have done the sniping course, then you're off to machine guns or anti-tanks. So you, it's not sustainable. With the, the tracking, I would, uh, I would have the nucleus in the reconnaissance because you've already selected people to, to do that sort of work. So they should have the right mindset. But even if they filter back out to become NCOs in the, in the rifle companies, you could perhaps still call on them you know, you might be in the Middle East or you might be operating in Africa and you think, OK, tracking is, is, is really a viable steal. So let's start pulling these people in. A tracking team has to have four to six individuals who are all trackers. It's not a case of put one person in with a, with a patrol. It doesn't work like that. Um, and then if, if you understand what trackers can do, 
then you start deploying those. So you might have two or three teams of trackers. We've, we've put you, we've pulled you all together. You're going to do some some training just to tune into this particular environment. And now you're going to go out into areas where they think there's enemy activity or, you know, there's there's been an incident. We want you to follow up. Um, Gather intelligence. And it's almost like if, if, if you knew the enemy were in this place, but now they've gone, but they tied a piece of string to a tree and they reeled it out, you would go, oh, I see, we'll follow the string to see where they've gone. And it, it's kind of like that, but it's not string. It, it's, it's marks in the ground that, that have been left by you know, the passage of those individuals. Um, and then you see where they stopped, you see where they've camped, you've seen how many, you've, you've kind of worked out what they're doing. And that's why it's such a, a useful <coughs> skill in, in the counter-poaching side. So to go to Africa and get involved in the military or um, anti-poaching rangers, it, it's, it's become now the most relevant skill that, that they can have. It's the most useful skill. If you read all of the books I was talking about um, from the Rhodesia, every single one of those individuals was trained as a tracker. And it was all about anti-tracking as well as tracking because everybody was tracking each other on both sides of the, of the war. That's interesting because my understanding of when the, when the British Army was doing this oh, very rec- up until very recently, tracking was not the focus, was it? It was... what In, in what in, era? In, uh, Last last five to ten years mm. yeah. of British Army being out and and doing anti poaching training and teaching of forces out there doesn't sound to me like the way they were doing it. As um, to how you would, ex- you no, would expect no, no. Okay, done. so the I I got involved with the the British Army coming out to Africa. Oh, okay. Um, to do to uh, there was a it's it's a long story how I got involved and and um but it um well you can come on to it and if you can go back and say if. You, you you go to where you want to go. Carry on from. Yeah. If I've just jumped you forward by several years. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, no, not at all. Because I, literally from Botswana, it was a case of okay. Now what am I going to do? You know. Okay. So that that was great. But wouldn't this be great if I could find work here? You know. And at that time, there was maritime security was quite big, and I was putting my CV out because you're thinking where, where, where's the longevity of work. Um, but I'd already sent my CV out to a few people involved, you know, conservation, um, charities that were that were funding. And my CV landed on a desk of a very interesting guy. He's an Australian intelligence officer from the Australian Army who transferred over to the British Army um, to be an intelligence officer because he wanted to get involved in Afghanistan. The Army completely messed up his, his transfer and he ended up as a corporal in a tank. In the tank unit, <laughs> try going. What the f- hey, mate? What the what the fuck do I know about bloody tanks? You know, out in Afghanistan, going that was a sh- that was shit, wasn't it? <laughs> but he got but he got involved in in the intelligence side, and and he actually got a um an, an MBE or a, an award because he 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 rumbled. You know, you can read about him online. Luke Luke Townsend, what a great guy. Um, uh, a Taliban attack on a on a compound, and and uh, he was the one who got involved with the whole intelligence side of that, and and averted what was a could have been a very nasty thing. So when when they were winding down from Afghanistan, he wrote a letter to Prince Charles and said, "Why don't we get we got all these skills, intelligence, um, you know, infantry skills, medics. We're winding down from Afghanistan. Why don't we get involved in counter poaching?" Wouldn't that be a great thing for the British Army to do? And Prince Charles wrote back to him and said, let's have a meeting uh, and, and, and sent him off to Africa, do a, go and do a recce and come back with a plan. And that's what he did. And my CV landed with him during that process. And he looked at it and he went, ah, tracking, because he understood the value of tracking, what an important skill it was. So um, after, after uh, Botswana, I ended up in, in Kenya, um, doing, getting, getting shot at and by cattle poachers and, and stuff. Did a, did a month there, t- uh, filling in for an old, an old pal who was op- operating out there. That's quite an interesting story. And then I was flying back to the UK, thinking, okay, well that was interesting. Nearly got my head shot off. Uh, How long were you doing that for? Th- this was uh, just a month, and it, I, I literally <laughs> stepped in there. An old mate of mine from the regiment. Uh, put an email out, you know, 
I need I need a break. Can <clears throat> can anybody come in and and uh, fill the gap? And I've still got the email, and it said uh, the it's it's shit conditions. There's no money. You've got to pay your own way out. You've got to buy your own food. Um, the, the 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 natives are wild. It, it's a crazy, but the ranges are great, and Africa's fantastic. It's a good cause. And I was thought there's no money in it, but I've got nothing else on. So I I thought oh shit I'll go out. Um, so I spent a, a a month in Lycipia in um, in a in a park there, which is the park they they made the film I Dreamed of Africa. Okay. Um, Cookie Goldman, amazing lady. Uh, so what were you doing day to day then? Patrolling. Going out, going out with the rangers, patrolling, um, and because what is, is massive problem with with herds of cattle and armed and aggressive um, uh, tribes, there the Pakot and the Samburu, their whole thing is is cattle. The cattle are owned by um, uh, criminals, corrupt officials. It, it's their currency, their former currency. So if you've got two thousand cattle, then you're a rich man in Kenya, but at the time of drought, and it was a year of elections, which is uh, a, a toxic mix. The politicians, some of them probably owned a lot of the cattle, were promising the locals, you know, vote for us and we will give you your, your lands back, which is all the conservancies and cattle ranches. So it, it got very heated. A lot, of, a lot of people being shot, a lot of people being killed at that time so I, w I was going out with the rangers and we were staking out areas where they were pushing the cattle in hiding low all, all the cattle coming over and then leaping up to to capture the the herders take them to the the police station so the herders and, are and stealing they... the cattle no sorry the herders were stealing the cattle no they, it, it was their cattle and they were pushing them into the conservancies oh. to, to eat the grass Oh, and they shouldn't be in there. Yeah, because outside it. of it, the place was like the moon. You know, there's, there's, it's just overgrazed, and and still is to some extent. Um, there's the fact there's more people getting killed in Kenya now than, well, almost um, East uh, West Africa. Um, so we we were doing that, but then we I, I had a flight round and identified illegal cattle bomers, and, and a cattle bomer is a is a, um, is a, a compound where they keep the cattle. So inside the conservancy, which is a massive place, um, there was illegal cattle bomers. So we started going out at two in the morning and, and hitting these cattle bomers, um, trying to capture the individuals, taking stock of all their kit and then burning, burning them down. Of course, that raised the, um, the, the anti, you know, feeling. Um, I ended up with a, apparently a price on my head for doing that. And we, and we ended up in a, in a bit of a, a gun battle there. Um, and then, uh, so I, that, that was my month there, you know, and it was, was like, Holy shit. One month. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a month there. And, and, uh, my mate Andy came back and I was, I was like, cheers, mate. Thanks for that. <laughs> Fucking good bloke. Uh, here you, here you go. Have it back. So I was on my way back, uh, early morning flight into Heathrow thinking, here we go again. What am I going to do now? You know, I'm, I'm still living in a, you know, cottage that needs a lot of money pumping into it. Um, what am I going to do now? And as the, as I switched my phone on, as we're taxiing in, this this email came through, bing, and it was from Luke, my Australian pal. And he goes, hey, mate, uh, yeah, we've, we've had a few messages going backwards and forwards. What are you up to? I need to speak. I was like, oh, okay. Well, I'm, doing, I'm, just, I'm just coming in at Heathrow, mate, but I'm going to be free. And it's all Heathrow, and he lived just down the road. <coughs> Um, so we met in uh, McDonald's close to Heathrow, with uh, you know over over a, a, a muck shit breakfast um, and a, a muck shit coffee. Yeah, muck, <laughs> muck shite. Muck shit. Have a muck shit breakfast. <laughs> uh, but we made a plan, and he said, right, okay. This is he gave me an outline of what was going on. So it was British Army going out in small teams, pre-selected to go out there and and work with the rangers. So the idea was one individual would go out with a team of rangers. Then they, you know, the, in that park, they would have medics who would do medical training. You'd have the me Remy mechanics who would fix all the vehicles, an officer to, to run the operations room. They would bring mapping in. So everything that the army should be good at. Um, to come in there and, and just work with the parks. And it was a fantastic idea. Uh, so I got involved then uh, with the training of the first batch who had been pre-selected, more walks of life, 
you know there was a there was a chef there was a mechanic there was a guy who'd been in the band you, you mean training of the british soldiers training to, of yeah, the, yeah, yeah this yeah, is yeah. me now yeah. Training, so they've been pre-selected. They come out in a group. We went to Kenya to uh, bat up <coughs> British Army uh, training Kenya uh, to put these guys through the paces. You know, this is the bush. This is about dangerous animals. I, I work with a guy, a South African guy called Tom Tom Fleetwood. Um, he's he's the best bush survival person I've ever seen. You know, we've worked with some good guys. What he doesn't know about the bush. So you know, bush bush survival tracking a lot of firing you know live firing to prepare them now to be rangers to go into the parks um and it it it, it worked well until so that first batch went out but the problem was is the restrictions that the the army faced the health and safety restrictions so whereas they wanted to go out and work deep in the bush for days at a time um all of a sudden now they they weren't allowed to go more than about a, a k and a half away from an ambulance. Um, you couldn't work in a park unless you could get to a hospital within a, a short amount of time. Um, so these restrictions had a, an effect on well, you know, their, their effectiveness. And the park manager going, hang on a minute, you you know, you can't drink the water. You can't drink the, the water that comes out the borehole that everybody else drinks. Um, so water. massive containers full of bottled water and you can't eat the food that they eat because it's, you know, it hasn't been through the, the army process of, um, uh, so the first, the first group we trained kind of went okay. And some of those guys got really involved in, you know, it was working as it should do that <coughs> Luke intended. Next, we, it, it kind of went to a brigade and the brigade, you know, 11 brigade. And they said, uh, we don't. We don't, you know, we don't need to select our guys. They're all, you know, infantry and they're ready to go. So the next batch were just, you know, unhandpicked, and um, that was um, Coldstream Guards. Um, and they came in, and we went through the same training, but they were even more restricted to to where they could go um, because of the conditions, the potential dangers, the threats. So in 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 short the army tried to stand up to do what was going to be an amazing task. I would love to have been involved in that, you know, as a young soldier, but the restrictions that were put on them just meant that they, they couldn't really do an effective job. Uh, so, and then we, you know, the, the awful tragedy, um, of one of the guys being, being killed by an elephant that made the, made the headlines. Um, and, and that didn't help at all then then they put the Gurkhas in and said well maybe the Gurkhas will be better able to do it so we trained the Gurkhas um and, and again amazing amazing individuals the sort of people you want in a battle to, to be with uh great rugged robust soldiers but not necessarily um the best at adapting to the way a ranger operates because rangers are not military and this is a problem the military have is trying to adapt your your skills, your procedures, your SOPs, your, your operational procedures to the way a ranger works. What and, are the key differences? Um, uh, a ranger is is more a law enforcement individual in a military context. So you're not you're not training a ranger to be able to to fight battles with a you know with with a foe who could be in, come from any angle, for any 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 sort of. Um, uh, different environment they know the environment they're just policing it um and they're they're policing it in a way okay they're patrolling they want to move without being seen so some of the skills we have in the military are relevant but an awful lot of the skills and the the way we would do things in a in a an infantry or a military unit are are not required you know all of you your sort of obstacle crossings and the you know the patrol RVs and all of those things that we would we would naturally do and expect to be the right way to do things are not necessary and to try to teach rangers who are basically they're from the local communities they have natural skills and a and a completely different mindset and they don't need to be indoctrinated with this is how you do stuff you cannot put, you cannot overlay structure on them. You have to work with their natural ability. 
to 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 communicate with each other to talk to 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 be able to explain this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it, it there's a natural flow to that um and you have to tap into that and train them in a way that works for them you cannot bludgeon them with a military pamphlet and say this is how you know this is the way it should be doing this is the only way you should do it um and and that's been the problem with a lot of military organizations and people who have come from the military as a trainer you know it takes a while to work it out that you're the people you are training men and women are of a completely different makeup a different mindset and the way you train them to be effective in, in what they're doing you have to leave all of that military stuff behind and just pick out what might be useful um, the way you communicate with them the way you you train them is is totally alien to a lot of military individuals so um you know as, as we're sort of trying to recruit new trainers coming into it you've got to be very careful how you select the right people and this was a problem with the with the army getting involved in counter poaching and working and, and becoming a, effectively a ranger it takes a selection process to filter out the people who are not suitable and that's what we should be doing uh, that's what we could have done because we know the right kind of people to do that uh, so it, it, to be honest it was a it, it would didn't go well for the army and um, the army are in, involved now in, in places and I've come across them in, in Africa training the army the army training the army is fantastic and no nobody better to do that but to to reinvent yourself as a law enforcement ranger where where you know law enforcement is more is one of the most important things you know? understanding the legislation of that country um understanding you know witness statements um crime scene you know we, we teach crime scene you know how to, how to work crime you know crime scenes collection of information present presenting that information how to present yourself in a court of law all, all of that stuff as well as going out and patrolling and you know putting an observation post uh, but tracking is the most useful skill because you're going out you're walking around a park in an area that you you suspect poachers te poaching teams will have come in the only way you're going to know apart from <coughs> intelligence is to go into a search formation with trackers and look for the spore the, the signs that are left behind you find it you assess the age you assess the direction assess how many numbers and then decide is is this worth following up and and hopefully those poachers who have come in will still be in the park because they you know they, they could be in there for several weeks so you then dis, you're into your disruption um arresting and everything else so uh, without without tracking you're just wandering around hoping to bump into somebody you know trespassing conducting illegal activity with the tracking you've got your eyes on the ground you've picked up the tracks okay somebody's been passed here in the last 24 hours okay we're onto them now and um a good tracking team will not lose that track you know they will and, and this this is why it was such a an important skill in in the rhodesian wars because that's exactly what they were doing you know we, we pick up the track the insurgencies have, have come in okay we're going to follow them up now until we're close enough to realize okay they've got a base camp there do your reconnaissance pull back call in the fast jet strikes and, and that sort of stuff but it's all based on the, the tracking ability so that's that's why it's so important for the uh, anti-poaching rangers to find out who's in the park who's been in who's perhaps already left but okay so what what have they been and done what what are, what what are they after follow it down okay we're down at the river the next thing you've got a hippo carcass you found the camp where they've smoked all the meat from the evidence that you find from doing your sort of forensic search um, you find items of food that can perhaps connect the the individual to which community they've come from okay follow them back out okay they've they crossed over the border here they operated there and they crossed back there therefore you know you you've you've now 
um, you, you got your focus on a particular community and then your intelligence and informers get to work and then your rangers are then going around and they're knocking doors down um, to to carry out arrests, you know. Canine unit, perhaps some of these parks have got good canine units now, detection dogs and tracking dogs, and, and they, they come to the fore as well. So, you know, it's a fantastic opportunity for the... You know, I wish I could reach back to, you know, the old Power Reg pl recce platoons and say, OK, you've already been pre-selected. Come out to Africa and, and let us show you how to work and operate there. They they are the people. And I, I've worked with some quite a few Marines. Um, so it's, it's people of that sort of caliber as opposed to, you know, infantiers. uh who, who perhaps have spent most of their time doing public duties or, you know, they, they haven't necessarily got the mindset uh, to go out and be alert. Because African bush, it's a fantastic learning environment because everything's dangerous. Everything's going to kill you, you know, from the insects to the snakes uh, to the, you know, the big animals, you know, the elephant, the buffalo, the rhino, the lions. So your head's on swivel the whole time. And then you've got the, you know, the armed um, poachers. When did the when did the army stop um, operating out there in the poaching uh, uh, training capacity for the Rangers? Several several years ago, we we had the the first individuals, and then we had the the Coldstream Guards came out, and then we had I think two batches of Gurkhas, and then that was it. So maybe 2019, 2020, something like that. Um, which which was a great shame. It, it was a real shame, but there was they, not their fault. They were so hamstrung with um, health and safety, uh, you know, restrictions that they just could not operate. Other other than going there and doing medical training and stuff within the the safety of the um, the the parks and the HQs themselves, actually going out on the ground and doing the job. Because I don't think anybody wanted to be involved in. You know, a poacher's been shot, and it, oh, and now it's a British soldier who's who's been in a firefight and killed a poacher. That is is going to be headline making stuff, and then there's going to be stories of mercenaries and why are you involved there, and so you can understand the the reluctance on behalf of an awful lot of senior people in the in the army, I think, to to get too involved in that because it's just going to open up a can of worms. You know, it's not an operation, so they they can't give it an operational, um, you know, uh, covenant to say that gloves are off and and um, rules are you know the the, um, uh, the what do you call it rules apply here. It's like go out there, but don't don't get involved in any any sort of um, anything that might cause uh, a lot of public attention kind of thing so uh, i think it was a great shame but the the army is involved now like i say training training armies in various countries um and that's what the army does really really well so there must have been a gap a gap left there then, when when they left because it was still, obviously a training requirement for the for the rangers and an upskilling yeah is that what big five plugs yeah thing. yeah so whilst we were training the military we were in between that we were training rangers um so i i sort of oh, so realized that was big five, you're doing that under big five protection at that time yeah oh okay yeah okay. yeah um I, fo I formed big five protection in about 2019 i think because i i needed more trainers so that's when um i, I called on the likes of christy vincent um paul who was again with with us in back in the days of three power both went into the police side so we had the 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 sort of intelligence and undercover side and with paul we had the sort of um he he was part of the so19 so very very highly trained on all the weapon skills and policing so we had a mix of military and policing and that's a great mix when you're when you're training rangers because that's what you need law enforcement first a degree of military skills you know is helpful and then with christy uh then we got shay shay doyle involved you know shay mad as that mad as a fish as well um so he's been involved with us as well so they they bring another angle 
to it, you know, which um, is is so vitally important in the in the fight against poachers, because it's everything is in, it needs to be intelligence led, you know. So so getting informers, um, understanding the 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 network of corruption that envelopes around the the, the parks, um, and finding people who can basically tell you what's going on in the village, and whether it's just sustainability poaching. Someone's been in and they're, they're you know, they're, they're killing um, uh, smaller animals uh, to take and eat for the family or whether it's higher level and people going in there to order in order to sell. And then you've got your criminal gangs who are going after ivory and, and, and horn. So Shay and Christie, are they, what are they bringing to the party? Asset handling? Um, they're, they're bringing... I mean, they bring an obviously awful they, they've, got, they've got the military background. Obviously, they've got the military I know Chris background. Chris has got Iraqi background as but, well. But then it's a case of convincing the parks that there's a need for intelligence, um, searching for and training potential informants, and and building all of that network. Because mm. the parks that have got a good um, sort of undercover sort of informant network and and methods for for them to give information and that links to the local police because what those guys are they're, they're bullshitters basically <clears throat> they they can talk their way I've, I've listened to those two you know we, we got into a uh, a police station in the middle of nowhere in zimbabwe or somewhere like that and they they just start the old bullshit talk shane know? christie yeah, Shane Christie. <laughs> and before you know it, they're the best friends and they're offering training, but they do it in a way that nobody feels threatened. And, and uh, you then start to identify the, the good individuals and, and, and that. And then so you start a network with the local police, which is important because the police, some of those police are involved in the, you know, the whole poaching thing because they're all, they're all from the same community. And then the magistrates, okay, let's, let's get in bed with the magistrates. Not in bed with the magistrates, but let's get to know them and then start um, kind of working them in a way. I'll tell you a story. I, I, was, I was with a pair of them. We were, we were in um, uh, Vic, Vic Falls in Zimbabwe. Um, I think I was going there trying to find illegal tires for the, you know, for the park we were working in. And uh, we went to the supermarket. Me and Shay went in to do some shopping, and uh, Chrissy said, oh, I'll, I'll stay with the vehicle. I'll, I'll guard the vehicle. Like, okay, oh, fair enough. Didn't want to get involved in shopping. Doesn't want to get his wallet out. Um, <laughs> by the time we did our shopping, we'd come out. We said, where the, where the hell is he? And there was a, a, a tree, and uh, a shaded tree, and there was a, a, just a bunch of guys sitting around under this tree. But well, he's now in the middle of them. Chatting away, slapping, shaking hands, you know, getting a, getting a phone number here and there. And when he came back, he said, uh, in a very matter-of-fact way, oh, there's a, there's a guy there who knows that uh, some of the wood carvers are, are, are carving um, horn and, and, uh, and ivory. So there's a, there's a direct link there, and he's prepared to give information and that. So then, then we went to, um, there's um, a particular type of police who are the ones who, who get involved in all of that sort of stuff, sitting in Vic Falls knocking on the door there and um, introducing ourselves, having a good old bullshit chat, like, you know. So before you know it, we're now passing on this information, linking this guy who's now an informer uh, because he knows you know, what's what's going on underhand with the woodcarvers because they're, they're, they're taking ivory and passing that, you know, through a network. So everywhere you go with them, we we couldn't get fuel at the time. All the fuel stations were shut because of the elections in in Zimbabwe. So we're like, ah, oh, you know, shit, we can't get the fuel, and uh, the the garage is shut. You know, go away. We've got no fuel. So the pair of them jump out of the car, the Land Cruiser we've got. Just give us a minute. The next thing they're chatting to the guy at the pumps, chat, chat, chat. <laughs> the next thing they're moving the bollards, waving us in. We can have as much fuel as we want. Just just by you know, yeah, yeah, we're from the uh, conservation, big fire protection. You know, you, you're the best, you know, you, you're the nicest person we've ever seen. And before you know it, we can actually go into this station now and we can get as much fuel as we want because it's there, but they just can't, they just can't sell it. So it's that, that kind of ability to, to bullshit. 
Yeah, you know, I don't know the pair of them as well, a, a half or even a quarter as well as you do. Mm. But in my mind, I'm thinking I need to be careful around these guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking you, I got away scot free when they're in the studio. You, you, you kind of get the feeling <laughs> that you know you're having good old banter and a good old laugh, but you're you're also being uh, almost exploited, you know. And I I see them in a conversation around a campfire, chatting away to people, and you can see how they work. They're not just talking to everybody, having a good old laugh and a banter. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're getting under their skin a little bit and finding out who they are and are they going to be of any use. And um, it, so they, I think they can't help themselves. They, they're kind well, of working. It's a unique skill, isn't it? And, yeah. and, only, and, and intelligence there that yeah. only comes from that background that they've got in yeah. what they used to do with the police. Yeah. That is fascinating. Yeah. It, did, it didn't surprise me that Christie got involved in, in that. I mean, he disappeared off the ra radar for years and then I met him in Hereford once. And I thought I thought you were probably dead, mate. I think you're still about. Uh, and that's when he was finishing. And then, you know, I've heard some of the stories of the criminal gangs he's been involved in. And um, he was always a... Um, kind of never took anything seriously, and neither of us did. You know, we our days through through Power Edge, it, it was just a laugh, as it as it always is. You know, nothing's taken seriously, but but it kind of is. And he's got that level of intelligence where he can act the fool, um, but actually he's not. He's he's as sharp as as sharp can be. Uh, and that's why we always got on because I was thick as pig shit and he was, <laughs> and he was, he was uh, sharp. So we, we always had a good banter. Um, and we, you know, we, we actually um, we registered with an employment agency. This is back in Power Edge days. So in our time off at the weekends, we would end up on you know, building sites or one of the guys had a, a, an HGV3. So we did fur furniture removals. Would end up in London, you know. In, we ended up in Knightsbridge once, you know, moving these furniture for, I think, a, a Dutch ambassador or something like that. Um, just bluffing our way. We got no idea how to move furniture, but you know, we were we were earning thirty pound a weekend or something like that, <laughs> and we just laugh our way through the whole process. <laughs> it was just, you know, it it, it was just a ball. So it's great now. We, we're all working together. We're all back together in Africa, you know. Thinking, how did that happen? What's uh, hmm. what or where is the focus for um, Big Five protection at the minute? Um, well, we've so we've we've put put the company together. We've got a website, so it's something that people, when we're talking about who we are, they they can look at. Okay, Big Five protection. It's not updated because I'm I'm shite at doing that sort of stuff. Um, but we've we've got continued. Uh, continuing work now we've we've got more work than we can actually um raise you know to to, to actually go to so it's becoming a bit of a problem and we need to recruit more people uh so africa's um on and off you never know you know a job will come up and it's like two or three weeks time and then it might switch off and then you, you're sort of left what's next <clears throat> Uh, so Africa has been a focus. We've been all mm -hmm. over Africa, uh, including West Africa, Benin, where there's, there's been a lot of badness going on, a lot of people being killed recently. Um, but I've, we've had a calling to go off to, I'll just say the Far East, to do the same sort of thing in an environment where there are, are poachers. They've had no, the animals there, the iconic species as the elephant, the rhino's almost extinct. Um, there's, there's, there's a whole load of sort of cats, bears uh, and stuff that have had no proper ranger type protection. So um, this was something I was involved in a few years ago. I went over there and I met the, the people. And I put a presentation to the forestry department. You know, you need proper rangers now because of the poaching, because of the threat. And the, the, the amount of land that's used up for, you know, things like oil palm and that. So the, the, the jungle now is so restricted in those areas. Um, and so we put a plan together. It was going to be funding, then the funding dropped out. So it was like, okay, we're well, back in Africa carrying on, but it's just risen its head again. So now we're, we're all going out to uh, the Far East um, I won't. I won't say where for now because um, Christy and Shay are going to be involved. So myself and Paul are going out. We're going to select and raise the first ranger unit. 
Shay and Christy are coming out, and they're going to get straight away involved in the in the how to how to crack the um, the under you know the networks of poaching, um, informers, all that sort of stuff. So it's a, it's a two tiered thing, um, and it'll be the nucleus of of what will be the first dedicated anti poaching unit out there. So it's going to be, it's been a long time coming, uh, but it's going to be a, a, an excellent project, you know, because we're starting from scratch. So instead of going into a park where we've already got rangers and they've, they've always worked like this and operated like that, and we have to change some things, we're going in from the start with the blank, with the blank canvas. Uh, so that's, that's going to take us up until pretty much Christmas. So we, we're just planning that now booking flights anytime now and it looks like it's going to it's going to come off um so we'll we'll see what what happens there how that grows because it's like i say it's an untapped corner of the world um which has it hasn't had the focus and the funding and and every because africa everybody knows about africa and the, the exploitation of the you know the demise of the animals and a, a hell of a lot of funding does go but it has to spread a long way but um, there's corners of the Far East, and because of its close proximity to Vietnam and China, which are the, the two major hubs for all the illegal wildlife trafficking, um, it's, it's, you know, there's species out there which are almost, almost gone. Mm. Um, you know, there's, there's small pockets where there's most, you know, that some of those, or, you know, those animals still exist, but they, they won't be for long. The encroachment of illegal logging, um, uh, oil palm, you know, it's just, it, it, it's, it's crazy the amount of um, land that's, that's disappeared. And once rainforest is gone, it's taken millions of years to become uh, an organic, you know, um, structure such as a rainforest, which you'll know, you know, you've been out of the jungle. It's uh, proper, proper rainforest has a real harmony about it a real buzz everything's working together you know you get the night chorus of cicada beetles and, and everything and then the morning and um every it, there's a there's a hum to those environments and you, you can just tell that it's taken millions of years for all of those you know microorganisms insects birds primates <laughs> to to operate and work in that sort of harmony and you're there as an individual, almost um, as a guest. And uh, if you don't get your act together, you're going to get wiped out, you know, <laughs> by the first bit of deadfall that comes down <laughs> yeah. or, or whatever. Uh, but, uh, you know, th those areas are getting rarer and rarer, you know. And once they're gone, you can't just plant some more trees and bring the jungle back. Um, you know, it, it, it would take a, thousands of years, I suspect. To, to get those, e you know, they're, they're all mini ecosystems in their own right. You know, you see the, you know, the, the way it rains, the way the mist rises and the way it rains again. Uh, and um, it's it's just tragic to see, you know. I've, I've driven across th this country and just like, as far as the eye can see, it's just oil palm, straight roads, even up into the mountains, you know, disappearing into the clouds. They've still managed to chop everything down and, and put oil palm there. Mm. Um, it's tragic. So, you know, it might be too little, too late, but it'll well, be hopefully interesting. Not. Hopefully not. I mean, I think ev everyone, everyone wanting in life should go and visit the jungle at the very least in, in any capacity yeah. whatsoever. Yeah. Be that a day trip if you happen to be somewhere in this jungle within a day's journey. Yeah. Just what? Just absolutely. It is. It's like you can describe it like this. Yeah. Or you can see it on TV. But to go and be there mm. in it is uh, something else yeah. entirely. It's one of them, yeah. my most favorite, <coughs> favorite environments, ecosystems to put yeah. you on yeah. the planet, wherever, yeah. wherever. Yeah. Just yeah. incredible. Mate, it's been an absolute pleasure to you. Ple ple pleasure to you. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. <laughs> uh, yeah, it really has. I've really enjoyed it. I was looking yeah. forward to this, especially after our conversation on the phone what, yeah, last yeah, week. Yeah. I thought this is going to yeah. be quite a quality. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you've got such a fascinating background, military and not, and not military. And plus, you know, what you're doing, what Big Five Protection is doing, super important in, yeah. in the world of conservation, super important. And um, it puts it on people's radar, you know, and uh, and also 
keep taking care of those two flipping lunatics or three lunatics I, I should I, say yeah Shea I'll keep Christian on the Paul. short leash I've not I've not met honest. Paul I'm assuming he is of the same character so it's not quite the same a, a different <laughs> character but um, st- still a, b- a bit of a dark side to him I think <laughs> he's a, he's a great 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 guys to work with what a what a privilege but you, you know I'll, I'll just say before we finish that uh, we're all we're all getting to be old bloody men now uh, so we, you know, we need to carry on what we're doing. So we're always on the lookout for the right type of individual with the right background to come and get involved because we need to start handing this over. Um, so, so how do it, people get in touch with you? Um, have a look on the the website uh, www.big5protection. Uh, oh, sorry, b5p. Uh, dot, dot co. Dot uk. Um, and yeah, just just I'll check, check it, it out. Go on. But um, there's there's you can you can contact the as direct you know for the the um, yeah yeah you can you can contact us through the website or yeah, yeah b5p.co.uk yeah dot, dot co dot uk yeah so have, have have a look on there have a have a read up what we've been up to it's it's a, I I will get around to updating if I can remember how to do it um, but it's just. Uh, a snapshot of of what we're doing but we we do say on there we we need to recruit the right kind of people to come out with us shadow us don't expect any money you'll get you'll get absolutely fuck all um but what you will get is this this work is not going to go away it's not like the the maritime security or the oil and gas security uh the for the right people this is longevity of work and what a fantastic job you know, we're in there amongst elephants, lions, hyenas, people shooting back at you uh, and doing a, a, such a worthwhile job because these young men and women that we're training, you you watch their development and uh, there's some amazing people out there who had no, no, no hope. Local communities, what do they do? They get involved in poaching or, or, or corruption or something like that. So you're taking these individuals giving them training and you see how quickly they react and how they start sucking this information up. And from there you identify the real stars who have so much potential and we write reports on them and we flag that up to the management and say, right, okay, this, this young lady that we've just got, um, wouldn't say boo to a goose. She was like a rabbit in the headlight in the headlights, but now she's just found this inner confidence that she didn't know she had. And this is one of your superstars for the future. So keep that development going, you know. Mm. Um, and that's the satisfaction of the, the job. Living in shit conditions, a flimsy Chinese tent in the middle of the bush with elephants roaming around at night, drinking water and washing from the river, crapping in a, in a stinking hole in the ground, you know, um, and eating food that uh, is pretty damn dismal. So you've got to put up with that. You're not going to be staying in a lodge and there's no, and you're not going to be making huge amounts of money, but it's, it's got me through, um, you know, my mortgage paid off and, uh, you know, all the other debts I've had through divorce and everything else. So uh, for the right people, it's, it's work that's going to go on forever and fantastic work. Can people connect with you on LinkedIn? Yeah. You're no, the, I'm not. I'm not on. No, well, I'm, I only I'm, I only say because on the website there's no contact page. So. Uh, yeah, well, there is it's from is somewhere it? there. That's, there's a contact us, and it'll it'll go to. Uh, yeah. Just looking. There. Oh, sorry. I do apologise. Right yeah. to the bottom of the scroll. There we go. So through the yeah, website. Yeah. Yeah. We've also we've also got an Instagram um, page, I think, which um, people can have a look at and get an idea where I we have. Go. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. Right, so Instagram, Big Five Protection. Excellent. Superb. Simon, thank you for your time. Hey, thank what, you a, for your what time. a fantastic opportunity to come and waffle some shite. Listen, this is the best opportunity you've ever had in your whole life. I know, this is, this is <laughs> game-changing. Am I going to have paparazzi now? I, is that it? What's next for me? Bre- breakfast television? Well, well when, <laughs> when Christy hears about your, your, your rant about him on the, on the icebreaker... No, we're not going to say that, are we? Are we not? Gonna, no, no. Oh, he's heard it now. I have to he's send a bastard. <laughs> Cool. I hope he is listening. We're done. We're done. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck. Thanks, mate. Thanks. That's it. Thank you for watching Hey Chower. If you enjoyed this episode, why not become a Hey Chower patron? Hey Chower patrons. 
get exclusive access to premium content with guests like the one you just watched. There are private interviews with previous guests and with this guest that nobody will see except for the H-Hour patrons. So before this podcast was recorded, I recorded an exclusive Q&A, a shorter interview structured around eight questions. All the questions were chosen by patrons beforehand and that interview is online now for patrons. That happens every time. Patrons also get access to all of the episodes before anyone else. They get advanced viewing of the episodes. And you also get other perks and bonuses. All of the information is on charliecharlie1.com. Just hit the menu item, become a patron. It'll show you everything there, including access to the H-Hour Discord community and private patron-only channels on there. So go to charliecharlie1.com and hit the menu item, become a patron. Easy peasy. If you prefer to listen to your podcast normally, H-Hour is also on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcasts, it's on Google Podcasts, it's on all of the podcast apps. And if you don't even want to bother with a podcast app, you can go to the, the H-Hour website, charliechannel1.com, and you can actually play the podcast, video or audio, directly through the website, through your browser. Simples. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being a supporter. Like the video, subscribe to the channel, and I will catch you on the next episode. Thank you.